Speaking of St. Patrick's, how many of you guys celebrate St. Patrick's Day? Like you're super fired up about it, corned beef, hash, man, you're gonna go drink some green Kool-Aid later, all that stuff, man. St. Patrick, what a crazy guy. He was born right around the late 300s, and he was born in Britain. And yet he was traveling around and he was taken hostage by some marauders in Ireland and he was a slave and kept in captivity and abused in that way for many years. And he, his birthday is not even Patrick, it's like Maywin or something like that, but we'll call him Patrick. Patrick was there in Ireland and he had this heavenly vision. God said, hey, go west or east and you're gonna find a ship and it'll be your salvation. And so he took off and left his captive. He left his captor and he went to the shores and there was a ship and he got back to Britain. Oh, he escaped captivity. And when he got back to Britain, he gave himself over to the church and he became a Catholic priest and he served over there and led many people to Jesus. And then the Lord put it on his heart. He said, you know it would be radical, bro? You know it would be crazy? Go back to Ireland where you escape from captivity and find the people that took you as their slave and abused you. Find those people <laughs> and tell them I love them. Next. You know, it's like, <laughs> next, you know. How about Sunday school? How about I volunteer for Sunday school, you know? Like, I don't want to go to Ireland <laughs> and tell people about Jesus and he did it, and he went to Ireland, and he had an anointing upon him to preach and to teach in all over Ireland, and many people in Ireland began to get saved. So many people began to get saved in Ireland that they imprisoned him, and they arrested him again, and he would escape each time, and he just kept letting people know about Jesus. And there's so many traditions and lores, we don't know what really happened, but he was led to go back to his captor's house, the one who had enslaved him and abused him. And legend says that as he got closer to this guy's house, that the house was fully engulfed in flames, and he knew that he was coming. Patrick was coming to forgive this man, and the guy couldn't bear the guilt and shame. As a matter of fact, he's gone down in history, legends to say he was too full of pride to receive Patrick's forgiveness, and so he killed himself in the fire and burned up in there. Long story short, though, St. Patrick goes down in history as somebody who had his life so changed by Jesus that he was turned into a radical missionary, that God saved him in such a way, because he saves us, listen, to send us. He saves us to commission us to the work of telling other people about Jesus. You see, the good news that God's given to each one of every one of us has changed our lives, not just our lives, but changed us in such a way where now we have the key that unlocks the forgiveness, that unlocks the freedom, that unlocks the life for the people around us that once held us captive. This is crazy. This is actually what Jesus does. So when the ladies get together on April 17th and begin their four-week study on the church and how it was born, they're gonna talk about how Jesus left and said, hey, here's the keys. Go set people free. Go set people free. And you wanna, don't you wanna be set free? Who doesn't wanna be set free today? Let free from your own sins and bondages. Yeah, and Jesus says there's one condition. You gotta go tell other people. You gotta go set other people free too. That's why you're a free man. The, the one who's been set free is free indeed. So I want to encourage you on St. Patty's Day when you eat your Reuben sandwich later at Nana's or Georgie's. Which one's better, Nana's or Georgie's? Everyone say for Nana's? Yeah, Georgie's? <laughs> Me and Jan are the only right ones. That's crazy. So weird, so weird. Well, hey, be that as it may, take your Bibles now and let's get into the Gospel of Mark. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. I'm gonna read a few verses and then pray. We're gonna begin in verse 23. They're at church, Jesus is with his disciples. He's there in the northern region of Israel, in Galilee. Those of you who were with me a year ago, we too were in the northern region of Galilee right now in March. We were there a year ago. They're in Capernaum in the area. And Jesus was there in Capernaum and he was preaching. He went to church with the boys. And as he got to church, he preached with authority and all heads turned to face this guy. They said, who is this guy who speaks with authority? Isn't it a wonderful day when Jesus gets your attention? when the Holy Spirit moves into your life. This happens once for salvation. It's a one-time deal in your life where you're like, life has changed forever. Then it happens over and over and over again. Maybe when your favorite song comes on or when you open up the word in that special way. Or maybe when you're just stunned by life and you realize that Jesus is real and he captivates you again. 
Last night, I found myself at the property. I had to go over there and do a little bit of maintenance and offload a trailer that was full of brush. And, and as I offloaded it, and then I just sat down. It was such a beautiful day yesterday. I just sat down, kind of exhausted and stunned, and I surveyed the scene. If you haven't been to our property, your property, the property, go check it out later today. It's a beautiful. And as I just sat there, my mouth dropped, and my eyes began to mist a little bit. As I just said, thank you, Jesus, for you. Thank you, Jesus, for you. For you. You have it all figured out. All of it encompassed in your gaze. All of it encompassed, Lord, in your plan. Because sometimes we forget, don't we? We forget. And we start to put our authority and our peace in other things. But when Jesus comes in with his word, man, he takes over your life again and again and again and again. I pray that happens today. I pray that you leave today saying, I can't believe I was so worried. And I can't believe I was so frantic. I can't believe I was so distracted. And the Lord says, stay focused on me. Stay focused on me. Stay. Well, anyways, Jesus is at church and he's preaching and all heads are turning. But then one head starts to spin. You guys know that guy. He's got a demon inside of him and there's an exorcism going on. And this guy's head begins to spin. Not really, but this guy begins to attack Jesus. Let's read the verse. Verse 23. He says, now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him. I just like that part. Jesus rebuked him. We're going to get the details in a minute. But here's Jesus at church with the distraction, with the dementor, with the demon, with the tormentor, with all these things, and Jesus just puts a stop to it. Because this is our king, this is what he does. Jesus rebuked him, it says there, saying, be quiet and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. And then they were all amazed. So they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? You ever been to a church service before, a summer camp or some event, some concert where you're just, what in the world is happening? What is this? This is when your eyes open up to Jesus. The next question they said is, what new doctrine or teaching is this? And their conclusion, for with authority, he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. Father, in Jesus' name now, we give our lives over to you in this time of study and devotion to your word would you make us students, Lord, that lean into your word, that receive your word, that respond to your word? Holy Spirit, we say yes and amen to all of the promises that are in Jesus. And would you take all those, Lord, demonic battles in our own lives right now, and would you rebuke them? Would you quiet them, Lord, by the authority of your word, by the clarity, Lord, that you bring? Jesus, we love you very much. We need your help to do this. We pray all this in Jesus' name, and everyone said here we find Jesus at church, and there's a demonic distraction. I would imagine there to be a demonic distraction, maybe at the bar down the road, or maybe at Sin City, or some afterglow party, you know, in the town. I am a little bit surprised that there's demonic distractions and activities at a church service, though, aren't you? Just a little bit, like, I don't know, man. It's church. It's going to be great. And sometimes we wonder, like, this marriage is going to be great. Having kids is going to be great until you have kids. I got two sons over there. And you find yourself sometimes surprised at where demons hang out and where the darkness lurks. Again, we would expect this in a drug deal or a scene over here. And I say that to say this, don't be surprised at the spiritual warfare that you find yourself in, in the ministry, at a church service. Don't be surprised at the spiritual warfare you find yourself in, in a marriage or raising kids or with family. I mean, have you found yourself dealing with spiritual warfare in ministry or in churches or in your marriage or raising kids? We're going to have way lots of spiritual warfare in sinful situations and in activities where we shouldn't be there and the demons are lingering. But this surprises me. And the Bible tells you and me, hey, 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 don't be surprised at the various trials you're going through. Paul Tripp wrote a devotional book, Two Married Couples, and he titled it so simply. It was all for married couples and how to be married happily. And his title for his book was, What'd You Expect? <laughs> <laughs> so good, you know? And when you're young, you're like, well, I expected a lot of things, you know? And he unpacks that. Whatever you expected, you probably got your expectations let down. My pastor said that expectations are premeditated disappointments. 
And you ought to just take your expectations on ministry people or relationships or having kids or all these things. Just, man, you don't, maybe you should actually expect spiritual warfare. Maybe you should actually expect some pushback. I get offended. I get surprised everything. Every time I do something valiant or right or honorable, like go to church or lead something, and there's all kinds of demonic activity going on and spiritual distractions. And so I'm glad for stories like this, which helped me to see that when Jesus showed up, things began to be stirred out. Let me just ask this question. How many of you guys are sensitive enough right now to discern that your spiritual warfare has ramped up in the last few seasons of your life? It's ramped up. It's not gotten any easier. And sometimes we think, if I just get this gone, if I get my bill pay all set up, and if I get my laundry service all organized, and if I turn my sprinklers on and they're on the calendar, everything's going to be perfect in my life. And all of a sudden, a demon shows up and says, ah, you know, like this scene here. And I don't want to be surprised because the devil's mad, mad right now. Peter tells us that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Here's what Jesus did, though. Let's focus on verse 25. It says, but Jesus rebuked him, saying, be quiet and come out of him. So cool. I'm not afraid of demons. I'm not afraid of distractions. I'm not afraid of devils because I know that he who's in me is greater than he who's in the world. And we have that same confidence. I'm not a demon hunter. I don't go picking fights with spiritual devil. I don't do any of that stuff, but I'm not worried about it. Jesus comes in as the power source. How? Through his word. You guys know that when Jesus was in Matthew chapter 4, tormented and tempted and tested by the devil for 40 days, he constantly used God's word to defend himself. He constantly used God's word to ground himself. Was it easy for Jesus in that time of testing in the wilderness? Someone be honest and shake your head and say no. The Bible says that at the end, the angels ministered to him. I imagine them putting IVs in him to get this guy some help. He's just been through hell and back. And yet he made it. How do you make it? Because he didn't focus on his own attention. He didn't focus on his own thoughts. He didn't lean on his own understanding, which is so easy for us to do. How many of you guys have a feeler right now? You guys got some feelings? Anybody got any feelings? Sometimes your feelings are wrong, though. Most often your feelings are broken. Your feelers don't work. And so we need, just like we sang that song, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. Jesus is always working. And he uses his word. God's word is so powerful. I'm going to read to you a few verses. Hebrews 4.12 says it this way. Hebrews 4.12 says that God's word is sharper than any two-edged sword. Let me just read it to you. It says, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and of marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word. Ephesians says it a little differently. Ephesians chapter six, verse 17 says, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Another verse that I've committed to memory and meditate on is in verse 16 of 2 Timothy 3. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and for reproof for correction and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And as you guys know God's word, the Bible says actually to hide God's word in your heart that you might not sin against him, that you might not stumble or fall out of line, to defend yourself with the sword of the spirit, which is his word, to let his word also flow through you and discern your own heart. Now, you guys know this stuff, but I'm telling you right now, you're going to face spiritual warfare today. You're going to face spiritual warfare tomorrow. You're going to face it the rest of your life. What are you going to lean on? On Friday, maybe, I think it was Friday, I found myself going into Fred Myers, the capital of spiritual warfare. (sighs) I'm kidding. Kidding. Well, it depends. You ever been there on senior day? Anyways, kidding. (laughs) It's not even funny. It's not even funny. Anyways, here's how it happened on Friday. I don't know why. I went there at 10 a.m. I had to get some goodies. I was making Sarah Yardley some cookies for her birthday. She just turned 22. Just kidding. But she just, I'm making some cookies for her. I had to get some stuff. And on the way in, I sensed I would see a lot of people at Fred Meyer's that day. And I kind of needed to armor up. And I was actually in a good mood, but I was pressed for time. And as I was walking into Fred Meyer's, I began to quote scripture under my breath. The scriptures that I knew. I don't do this all the time, but I would advise you to next time you're going grocery shopping. And I remember as I was walking and I felt the Lord strengthen me and embolden me. And then when I walked into Fred Myers, I saw so many of my friends and family. 
I prayed for people I hadn't seen in a minute. People introduced themselves to me with tears in their eyes as they've been watching our services and I prayed for strangers I'd never met. And I give all credit to the fact that I was able to tuck God's word into my heart before I went into the store knowing that there was battles about to go down. I wanna be battle ready. I don't wanna become battle weary. You're bound to become battle weary eventually, but why don't we find ourselves being battle ready? Guys, I'm not making this up. Look at verse 25 again. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be quiet and come out of him. That's not even a memory verse we're gonna commit to memory. You know what I'm saying? Like, be quiet and come out. We're not even gonna memory. That's Jesus' words, and when you take his word, the rhema, the spoken word, the logos, the written word, Genesis to Revelation, and you have those pesky things that come into your mind, and those doubts and those criticisms and skepticisms and the divisions. Jesus says, no. And he rebuked this demon. And I would just say, know the word. Do you know the word? What's, what's the day today? It's March something still? March 17th probably? St. Patty's Day? Yeah. Grab one of the March 5x5 five five reading programs. Start reading the word right now. Get into the word and get the word into you. Know the word. But don't just know the word. Man, why don't you start quoting the word? Start quoting it to yourself. Pick a couple verses, write it on two by five cards or three by five cards or post-it notes and put them in your car and then share the word. Has anybody ever shared the word with you in the real world? Man, it's so powerful. We've got the gospel gun loaded. Know it, quote it, share it, and believe it. And finally, if you wanna walk in full power, obey it. Obey God's word over your own thoughts, over your own desires. This is important because the spiritual warfare is not gonna stop. I wish it would. I wish, man, if we just quoted scripture and memorized scripture and did the right next thing, wouldn't we find ourselves being spiritual warfare free? And it's actually gonna get worse for you. As you put on a bigger backpack of God's purpose and power in your life, you say, all right, I'm gonna be an ambassador. I'm gonna be a lover. I'm gonna be a missionary. And all the devils start to freak out. Rah! They start coming at you. Here's the deal, though. The word of God is stronger than the devil. He flees. In the word of God, this is important. The word of God is not just stronger than the devil, but the word of God is stronger than the world around us. See, the world around us is very loud right now. It's very attractive. It's trying to get our attention, so many things. And the word of God will be a lamp for your feet, a light for your path. In a world that's going crazy, not only is the word of God more strong than the devil and more strong than the world, this might be the most important one for you, for that committee that lives in your brain. Did you know the word of God is stronger than your flesh? It's stronger than you. It's stronger than what you haven't done right. It's stronger than what you did do wrong. It's stronger. Quote God's word. Cleanse yourself, the Bible says, through the washing of the water of God's word. Well, here Jesus at church simply uses his word to quiet the nonsense wouldn't the Lord anoint us to do just the same thing? Verse 26, he goes on. It says, and when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. I don't know how you envision Jesus and his miracles because there's varying levels of speed that we measure, aren't there? There's the speed of light, which is so fast. You ever thought about the speed of light? Did you know the speed of light when Dan turns on the lights back there and the lights come on? The light is going so fast. The speed of light, you could circumnavigate the entire earth 11 times in one second at the speed of light. That's how fast it is! Okay, then there's the speed of sound, which is quite a bit slower. It's about 800, maybe 600 miles per hour. It's slower. Okay, then there's the speed of like a car, an automobile. Then there's the speed of a toddler running in the wrong direction. <laughs> you ever seen these guys? They're so fast, you know. And there's this, it's just speeds. There's so many different speeds. And so when Jesus does a miracle, here's my point. When Jesus does a miracle, how fast do you think it should be? Speed of light? Speed of sound? Speed of a toddler? The, the speed of natural growth? My point is, is Jesus told this guy to get out, to knock it off, and there was a convulsion and a crying out. There was a, there was a season of duress and stress until this guy was fully delivered. I just wanna encourage you. I've seen people struggle with certain sins, struggle with certain pains, struggle with certain oppressions for what I would consider longer than is what I had anticipated. Why is this so hard? Jesus, can't you just snap your fingers? Hey, Jesus, can't you just put this all back right? And he can and he does sometimes. But oftentimes, just like when you put a seed into the ground and plant it, it doesn't instantaneously produce fruit. 
It's got all the DNA and the networking and the design in order to produce fruit, but it's gonna take some water and some soil and some warmth and some time in order to actually become what God wants it to become. I say that to say this. In your battles, the demonic depressions and oppressions and distractions, okay? Someone taught me this years ago, fight until you win. Well, how much longer is it gonna be until I get rid of this guilt and this shame and this regret? Hey, fight until you win. Well, how much longer until I get full freedom from this distraction and from this oppression and from this addiction? Fight until you win. How do I fight? Quote God's word. Believe God's word. Know God's word. Share God's word. Obey God's word. Because sometimes I expected it to happen a little easier than it did, and it didn't happen as easy as I wanted it. But I would say this, it's gonna be worth it because the Bible promises that you and I are being transformed into his image more and more as we gaze upon him and trust in him. How many guys have found this to be true? You're growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. Now here's the crazy thing, you might not see it, okay? You probably don't see your spiritual progress if you're growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus daily, taking one step forward, two steps forward, one step back, one step forward, one step forward, and you're continuing to grow closer to him, you get discouraged, I get confused. People around you, whoa, man, you grew in the Lord. I see it, but the devil wants us to miss it so often. I say all that because I see this guy, and I wanna see instantaneous healing where he's just better, but there's a crying and a convulsing. Now, I don't know who needs to hear that right now been working hard trying to get rid of this addiction or this fear, been trying hard, like, should I just give up? Should I just accept this is the way it is? I don't know. I don't know. You think God has a plan? You think he's always working? And when you find that full freedom in him, it's going to change the lives around you. As a matter of fact, sometimes it's that struggle. Sometimes the people who know you best, maybe it's your spouse or your kids, they know the most about you. Maybe it's your neighbor's. Maybe you have more of a, a bigger profile life and people are watching you. Sometimes it's in those situations that the Lord is actually using you to change other people's lives. Because look at what happens in verse 27. It says, then they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. Stop right there, eyes up here. I just wanna make this simple observation that when this guy's life was changed and set free, even though there was a struggle, all attention and questions were about Jesus, not this man. We're actually not gonna know this man's name, but it's gonna say that Jesus' fame, <laughs> mushroom clouded all over the place, man. It blew up. How? Through another guy's struggle. Through another guy's salvation. Through another guy's restoration. Through another guy's difficulty. It was Jesus in his preaching of authority, Jesus in his praying, Jesus in his leading, and lives were changing, and this brought curious seekers closer to Jesus. And let me just say it this simply and personally, your life matters to the building, to the growing of Jesus and his church. This is humbling. Your life matters. Your life is a visual testimony. As a matter of fact, sometimes the battles that you're living in right now and fighting through are the exact visuals that people are praying for. Lord, if you're real, show me your reality. And then they look at your life and my life and our lives. They see, how did you get through that? Well, it took 20 years. Well, it took some struggle. It took some difficult. How are you doing so well after losing your spouse? How are you doing so after losing your health? Now, I don't want to sign up for any struggles or any demonic oppression or depression. I don't, want to, I don't want to do any of that. You guys want to do that? I want to go on vacation. That's what I want to do, okay? But sometimes our life isn't a vacation. Sometimes it's difficult. And the fruit is in verse 27. I've got it highlighted in a totally different color and circled and underlined. Then they were all amazed and questioned among themselves saying, what is this? Who is this? And as your life goes through its seasons of ups and downs, Sometimes we ask questions like whose fault is it or what in the world's going on? And yet all of the fame went back to God. This reminds me of a story in another gospel in John chapter nine. In John chapter nine, I refer to it often, but I'll reference it one more time in context of verse 27. In John chapter nine, there's a man who was born blind. And Jesus' disciples saw him born blind and they had an improper theology that his suffering was his fault or his parents' fault. And so they asked Jesus, who sinned? Is it mom and dad? Or was it him in the womb? Was he a bad little baby? You know, why is he born blind? 
And Jesus looked at his disciples and corrected their bad theology and said, neither his parents nor him sinned, but that the glory and the works of God may be revealed in his life. He was born blind. That's crazy talk right there. This guy had suffered for 30 some years in blindness. And God's framework was, yeah, that's gonna bring me glory. Can I get a different task? <laughs> can, I, can we do it differently? Can you make me really strong so I like flex and people give you glory? Like, eh, boring. Instead, this guy had everything thrown against him. So when Jesus came into his life and his life was put back together, all of the visuals and testimonies of his life would bring God glory and people would see the glories of God. I wonder oftentimes why I'm going through something, why this bad thing is happening. I deal with people all the time in their lives. Why did this bad thing happen to me? Why would God allow this? Maybe it's just so that way other people can see your struggle and God's provision and the way that he leads you and the way that he heals you. Also, it's not just for the people outside, but sometimes in those demonic dealings, in those difficult testings, that's the only way that God can sift out of you the flesh that remains, the things that are, you're saved, I'm saved, we're saved, woo But the Lord allows some things to get sour sometimes in order to bring that stuff to the surface to be sanctified once again. How many of you guys have realized that sanctification is a lifelong sport? Participation sport? Saved once, sanctified until I die. Sometimes it's those things I go through because Jesus wants to do a work in me. I love the question that they ask, what is this? What new doctrine, what authority he speaks with in verse 27, <clears throat> right there in the middle. And I like it because this is powerful. People are looking for something powerful right now, aren't they? Man, we love powerful people. We love a new politician or an old politician, or we love promises, and we love influencers, and we love sports. Isn't it crazy? how thirsty and hungry every single person in the whole world is for a savior, somebody to influence them or lead them or a sports hero to cheer for, they're the best, or my team made it to the Super Bowl, and all of these things. These guys hear one sermon from Jesus and see him deliver one person, whoa, 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 this is authority. Who does this? And Jesus grabs their attention in such a way where I think this ought to be seen and evidenced in our lives every single day this is what the word of God does. And I'm not against politicians or sports or events, but all of those things you've realized, and so have I, and they're just smoke and mirrors. They come and they go. And you might hope in the Chiefs, or you might hope in the 49ers, you might hope in something else, you might hope in a politician. They're not going to change you. They're not going to save you. What is this? What authority does this guy have? And when you realize this, it changes your life forever again and again. And they went on to conclude even the unclean spirits obey him. Now I say all that again, and I want to apply it to our own lives. Because if I told you some secret that's going to change your life and change other people's lives, you would be quick to tell other people, wouldn't you? Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you got to buy Bitcoin. You got to buy Bitcoin. You, know, you got to do this thing or you got to go here and invest there. You got to get involved in this thing that's probably temporal, probably horizontal. And yet God's, get, God's given to us an eternal investment that will not return void. Thief won't steal Moth won't eat, rust won't destroy. And yet, how quickly are you and I to share the word with other people? Most of us are intimidated to share the word. We're like, well, it works for me, and I don't really know if it's gonna work for my buddies, you know, and I'm not really sure how it's gonna work for them. And maybe you have questions about the word of God. You're, well, they're gonna ask me a good question. I don't know all the stuff, and I'm not like Pastor Luke, and I haven't been to Israel, and all. Listen. One day C.H. Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, was asked how to defend the Bible when sharing it with people. You know, here's the Bible and they're gonna pick it apart. How do I defend the Bible? And C.H. Spurgeon said, defend the Bible? You don't have to defend the Bible, just let it out of its cage. It's like a lion. Can you imagine trying to defend your pet lion? Well, if he gets out, he's gonna get hurt. <laughs> no, he's not. The word of God will not return void. When you have this type of confidence, in God's word for your life and for the people around you. In due season, his word will produce fruit. It won't be thwarted, it won't be cast down, it won't be stopped. These guys are musing, this is crazy. He's got authority, 
Lives are changing. What in the world is going on? And I just, and again, this is 8 a.m. service. It's packed out. You guys are here. Your lives have been changed. You guys know this to be true, but rehearse it. Let your heads be held high as you walk around the communities God's planted you in. The people around you need to see that you have your eyes on the Lion of Judah as well, that your lives are different. You're not hoping in the next politician or the next economic boost. You're not hoping in some other thing. And as you get older, don't your hopes just get kind of weird anyways? You start to realize, you know, you're older, like, oh, man, what happened? How did I get here? And things aren't working. Oh, no. And the Lord does that on purpose. So that way your hopes would be in him. Well, let's keep reading. Let's see what happens next. We're going to finish the next two chapters, so we got to hustle here. Look at verse, uh, <laughs> look at verse, nope, not doing that. Look at verse 28. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. I've already mentioned it. We don't know the demoniac's name. We don't know his name, but Jesus' name spread. And so, too, in your story and in my story, wouldn't it be rad if Jesus became more and more famous? I love our uh, warehouse in, down in South Beach. It's still there, by the way. They haven't scheduled demolition or any of those things moving forward yet. They're working on it. But you'll notice that we still have our banner on the South Beach warehouse down there, Jesus is real. And then on 101, there's a sign that says Jesus is real. And on Ferry Slip Road, there's another sign. I remember we put those signs up. I was like, whoa, I'm going to get in trouble, <laughs> you know, because it's such a bold duck declaration. Jesus is real. And yet every time somebody drives by there and every time I see it, I'm reminded of the infamacy of Jesus, that he is the most talked about person in the world. The most famous person in the world today is Jesus Christ. He's the most written about. He's the most painted, the most sung about, the most poems, the most argued about, the most studied person in the entire world is Jesus Christ. And we just studied a little portion of scripture in Mark chapter one where he healed one guy, boom, and his fame spread in that region. There were other famous people in that region of those days. I don't know any of them. But Jesus here, 2,000 years later, is still the most famous person, the most viral name spreading all around the globe right now is Jesus Christ, celebrating his birth, celebrating his death, celebrating his life. It's exciting. It helps me to then hold my head high when I wear a shirt that says Jesus is real or go to a church that believes these things. All this happened in one day at a church service. Okay, let's see what happens next. Let's keep going into some new territory. It says, now as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, same day, they entered Nana's for a Reuben sandwich. No, no. <laughs> no, they're going to go to Georgie's. No, it doesn't say that either. Now as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother, his mother-in-law, that's Peter's, lay sick with a fever, and they told Jesus about her at once. So he came and he took her by the hand, lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. Stop right there, eyes up here. What? Couple observations. They're leaving church, James, John, Peter, and Andrew. And they go to Peter and Andrew's house, and they take their buddies home with them. Here we see fellowship and hospitality. Hey, we're done with church. You want to go out to lunch together? You want to come to my house? And it's wonderful as the church dwells. Don't you just love the fellowship we have as brothers and sisters? It's so crazy. Thank you, Colleen. Me and Colleen are best friends. I don't know about the rest of you guys. <laughs> Let me ask it again. Look at me. Don't you love the fellowship we have with one another? Don't you love this? I love you guys. Man, I love you. I can't believe you haven't had me over to your house for lunch yet. I'm just kidding. I love you guys, and you love each other. There's something so special we have in the body of Christ. Let's never forget this. Let's not neglect this. Matter of fact, the other brothers and sisters, the other churches, the Bible wants us to grow and protect the bond of unity and the spirit of peace between us. Loving believers. What a privilege we have. But it doesn't just stop there, because it'd be easy to just kind of be unilateral in that way. Notice that they also had fellowship with Jesus. When they left church, they took Jesus home with them. They didn't just leave him at the church. Hey, Jesus, come into our house too. Can you imagine bringing Jesus Christ into your home? Like you text your wife like, babe, you better clean the house up a little bit. I'm saying, for real, I'm bringing God home. home. And that's not the point. It's kind of funny, but that's not the point. But when you go home, do, do you bring Jesus with you? I think you guys do. I think you guys do. I think you're walking in fellowship with each other. It's beautiful. And I think you're bringing Jesus home. Some people don't know how to bring Jesus to their home. They come to church, oh, I can't wait to go to church. We're gonna worship, we're gonna read, we're gonna pray, we're gonna study, we're gonna fellowship, we're gonna confess sins, we're gonna get communion. Oh, I can't wait, and that's all good. You can do all that at home. Did you know that? You can do all that at home, but you're gonna to have to make an effort to do it. Hey, let's turn the TV off a little bit, babe. Let's, let's, let's pray. Let's read the scripture. 
How's everyone doing? You're gonna have to create these rhythms. You can do it by yourself. You can do it with your spouse or your kids. It might be awkward for some of you because you've never done it at home. But I would just say, don't leave Jesus at church. Take him home with you. But as soon as they get home, I read the story already. You guys saw it. We see that there's trouble on the home front. When they get there, Peter's mother, Peter's, mom, Peter's wife's mom is sick. And I would just say what I've already said at the beginning of the service. Aren't you surprised when spiritual warfare just finds you all over the place? I'm not sure if this sickness was spiritually related or not. I know when Jesus stepped in, he healed her and cured her. So there was a spiritual dynamic. But I'll just say it this simply. Don't be surprised when the spiritual warfare finds you at home as well. Their response is so clutch. You know what they could have done? They could have just said, yeah, she's sick. We'll leave her alone. Don't worry about her. Hey, hey, Mary, oh, hey, Peter's wife, can you take care of everything? That would have been fine. But you know what they did? They brought Jesus home, number one. Then they brought their problems to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, we got a sick person in the back. I don't know if you knew that. I don't know if there's anything you can do for our, our, our home life. This is so wise. For so many reasons, so many reasons, we fail to bring our problems to Jesus. We don't want to bother him. We're just going to grind it out. We're just going to work it out. If I were to pull you in a real moment of vulnerability and maybe time, hey, write down all your problems. What are you dealing with right now? You're not going to be in trouble. Just write down all the struggles you've got. Where are you sick? Where are you sick? It would be volumes and volumes of pressures and issues and struggles and stresses. And yet I find I'm surprised at the end of this service, I don't know if we'll have time, but I usually pray for people and two or three people get prayed for. We have prayer meetings from time to time. But if we really knew the power of prayer and being vulnerable, yeah, Lord, I got all kinds of problems. I got all kinds of issues. My mother-in-law is laying sick with the fever. And here's the deal. Let's not keep our burdens to ourselves, but let's do what Peter says, casting your burdens on the Lord because he cares for you. These guys bring Peter's mother-in-law to Jesus and he immediately then begins to go to work in her life. And I love what he does. This is, men and women had different relationships in the first century. Men and women wouldn't be together in this way. You would never hold another woman's hand in this way, even though she's a mother, she's a little older. But Jesus breaks all those rules because he's so in love with people. And he wants them to know, I'm not a Pharisee, I'm not the law, I'm not the cops. And so he reaches out. This is one of the most enduring scenes in the scriptures where Jesus, to a sick woman, reaches out and grabs her by the hand. And then he lifts her up. And I imagine it wasn't just one of these, ah, straight up. I imagine he kind of pulled her, listen, to himself. And as Jesus pulled, she could have resisted. Why are you doing? You know, I'm sick. I'm going to some food, corned beef, you know. She, she could have resisted, but instead with Jesus' enduring pull towards himself, she obeyed. And as she rose up, she was healed immediately. Jesus could have just came in the room and stared at her. Get up. You know, I'm hungry. I just came from church. You think, he could have. Some of us approach God's word and God's character like, dude, he's so mad at me. I keep falling down. I'm suffering this issue. And he's just staring at me. Ever just feel like God's staring at you? That's not his character. Sometimes we feel God's yelling at us. Just get up. He could have yelled from the back room, better figure it out, you know, to her. But instead he approached her, held her by the hand. Imagine this Jesus holding you by the hand right now and whatever's keeping you down, whatever spiritual fever you're dealing with. And he's pulling you to himself. When you're sick and you've got a fever, you don't want to be near anybody. You're like, oh, I got the mask on, you know, and the thing, I don't want to be near. And Jesus says, no, I see you in your stuff. Come here, come closer to me. And he heals you and he ministers. It couldn't be more special. Jesus could have done it a whole bunch of different ways. This is the way he did it. They brought her to him. He approached her with this great love. Look at the fruit of this experience in verse 20. Nope, verse 31. It says, so he came, took her by the hand, lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her. And then what does it say? And she served them. This is so cool. So many cool things you could preach on. The fruit of all this, she goes right back into instantaneous serve, serving and loving and worshiping Jesus and the people around him. When your life has been changed, when you have been healed, it will best be evidence, listen, in the way you serve others. This is a huge deal. Jesus actually said to his disciples, hey, listen up. This is the apostles to the disciples, the main ones. If you guys want to be the greatest in the whole world, okay, I want you to have the blueprints, make sure you serve everybody. Don't seek to be served. That's so easy. That's so carnal. That's so fleshly. It's so worldly. If you really want to be a spiritual giant, and I think you guys are at the 8 a.m. service, you guys want to be spiritual giants, you're here. He says, okay, it's going to be evidence in the way that you serve other people. 
the way that you don't want to be served, but the way you want to serve others. And this was on the heels of being delivered. You ever been real sick before? You ever had a fever? You ever been sick? It's the worst. And then when you feel better, you're like, I'm better! And usually it takes a while, you know, and you got this recovery. She didn't need any recovery time. She instantly felt better. She wasted no time. She's a servant. Because he who's been forgiven much loves much. And I would just say this. Put this on just, if you want to have a great life moving forward, if you do, if you want to have a great life, great day. If you want to have a great week, okay? If you want to have a great life moving forward, make sure and ask yourself, am I being a servant or have I drifted into the camp of being selfish? This happens every single day for me. I wonder where I'm going into Starbucks or going into this event, going into this place, going into some, some other thing, going home. How am I going home right now after a hard day of work? Am I going home to be served by my wife and kids? Whoa, careful. Or am I going home to find a way to serve them? Because I've been healed and set free. And let me give you the two-edged sword of blessing. When you seek to and commit to and avail yourself to being a servant of others instead of being selfish like the world, when you choose, I'm just gonna serve. I'm gonna serve. Two people are blessed in that event. You're blessed because it's better to give than to receive. And as you serve, you get healed, you get lifted up, you get strengthened. It's the craziest thing in the whole world. Not only do you get blessed, but the people you're serving get blessed and refreshed as well. But when you're selfish and say, you know, I'm just gonna take care of me a little bit. I just need some me time, I need some meanness, and I need these things. Not only are the people around you left out and offended, but you'll never get what you're actually looking for. See, the world of God, the kingdom of God is inverted. It's an inverted kingdom where Jesus said, if you want to have a great life, don't seek to be served, but seek to give yourself over a ransom for many. Do it. Try it out. That's the fruit of this. There's one more quick story here. I want you guys to see this before I bring Bryce back up and lead us in a closing song. It says, at evening time, verse 32, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And then he healed many who were sick with various diseases, and he cast out many demons, and he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Stop right there, eyes up here. The fruit of this woman's service to Jesus was that Jesus, listen, was able to then serve the people in that community until the sun went down, until the sun began to rise again. How important is it that you serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? In your service to him, it unlocks opportunities for God to serve other people through the gifts and the responsibilities that you've contributed, that you've invested. Had she not risen up from her illness and made Jesus food, Jesus wouldn't have had the stamina to heal the rest of the people around. Sometimes I wonder if my contribution matters. Does it really matter? But I quickly answer that. Yes, it does. My two mites matter. My tithe check matters. My showing up early, staying late, saying yes to everything, it matters. It ma- How's it gonna do? I don't know how God's gonna multiply it. But I know that God has chosen to do it with us, not apart from us. I remember when the church was in the warehouse and Jim Shones and Sandy were the owners of it. And, and Jim Shones was very clear. He didn't want any recognition. He didn't wanna be on stage. He didn't wanna be a part of a committee. Didn't want any authority. Didn't wanna make any decisions. But he would uh, uh, discern what was going on in the church. And he would see needs in the church. And he would just write checks. Okay, I want that to happen. Make sure that happens. Hey, you want to be a part of the? Nope, just make sure it happens. That's my spiritual gift is to serve in this way. And I was so blessed. And he taught his kids to do the same thing. His kids are doing the same thing. And their grandkids as they go to church here. It's so incredible to see the fruit of generosity. And this woman sustained Jesus in his time of need. And I'm gonna have Bryce come up. He's gonna lead us in a closing song right now because we got the 10 a.m. service coming in hot. And I want to encourage all of us here this morning. Hey, what's the spiritual life going on right now in your life? What's the spiritual battle like? Is it real? It's real in my life. It's real in my life right now. And I'm going to use God's word, God's promises, God's truth, God's authority to defend myself. The shield of faith and the sword of the spirit. And I'm going to share it with others. So I'm going to find myself walking then in a way that causes Jesus and his fame to continue to spread because Jesus is real. And even as my life is not easy, nor will your life be easy, that's okay. Jesus is going to find himself using your life as a frame to display himself. Don't expect an easy life. That's in the life to come. You guys know that, right? It's in the life to come. But if you do want a good life, seek to serve, seek to give, bring people home, bring Jesus with you. You got a problem? Bring it to Jesus. Let him heal. As a matter of fact, let's all stand up and I'm going to lead us in this.
time of response. If you do need healing right now, or you do need Jesus to save you, maybe you're here this morning, you're visiting. And you're just not sure that you're a Christian. You're not saved. You're not sure that you're going to heaven. And today you want your life to be given over to the master. You want to be set free from oppression. You want to be given the words of eternal life. And you want Jesus to be your king and your sins to be forgiven. I'm just going to ask you right now. Is anybody here this morning would say, yeah, I want to be saved from my sins and be forgiven and go to heaven when I die. I want to make sure. Hands going up, confirmation. People saying, I want, yeah, amen. I see you guys. Hands, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done in our lives. Jesus, we love you so much. And Father, as we sing this song, we ask that you, Lord, would do battle on our behalf. We believe you. Thank you for the many promises of your word, that what you began, you will finish, that there is no weapon formed against us that shall prosper, that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. That, Lord, on the contrary, you'll sometimes allow our situation to get even more dark in order that the light shines brighter. So as we sing this song, Lord, we do so by faith. If you need prayer during this song, I'm going to be over here on your right, on my left. Come find me and I'll pray for you during this time as we sing and worship and give our lives to the Lord. Let's sing together.